So as I said last lecture, you know, there's going to be some room for debate a lot of times about what exactly the best way to fill a missing premise in is. But I want to emphasize that this is not, it's not just, well, throw in whatever you want, right? Usually if given different missing premises, we can sort out ones that are better or worse, right? And even though there might be some room for debate, I think the ones people tend to fill in will usually tend to be close to each other, right? They might be a little different. They're not going to be in a different universe. So having said all that, I want to start talking about how we do this, right? How we judge candidates for missing premises when presented with them, how we fill them in ourselves, how we fill in good ones. Um, so remember last time we had that argument, you know, about, you know, she's a feminist or a self-described feminist, so she's likely a liberal. And I said, well, think about these three possible ones. Hopefully you guys saw why the third one was better, but maybe you can't really explain it, right? So let's take another example. The FDA has fully approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine, therefore the Pfizer vaccine is safe. What's the missing premise here, right? Let me give you guys some choices. Pfizer is an American company. Any drug approved by the FDA must be safe. Drugs fully approved by the FDA are very likely to be safe. It's better than 50-50 that a drug approved by the FDA is safe. Now think about these for a minute, right? You know, if you were taking a test, what would you do? You would start crossing some out, right? Are there any of these that you can just cross out to start with? Well, A, right? talk about what that is in a second, but you can just get rid of A, right? So now we have B, C, and D. Think for a minute more, how would you rank these and which of these do you think is the best? All right, so before going back to, you know, what is the best answer here, let's think a bit about some guidelines for filling in missing premises. I think this will help. So there's three guidelines. Um, Lavin doesn't really talk about this. I tend to think he's better or at least as good as the um, Kelly book I originally assigned. The price is right, right? But, you know, Kelly talks a bit more about this and I think he gives some good guidelines. And the, gu and the guidelines for the missing premises <laughs> I think there's three that will be helpful. One, it should narrow the gap between the stated premises and conclusion, right? You know, the whole idea of missing premises is, you know, there's a sort of gap here. There's a, a you know, something that needs to be filled in between this first premise and the second one. A good missing premise should narrow the gap between the stated premises and conclusion. And we want to pick a premise that is likely to be true. You know, to get a good argument, remember it's about the form and the content. Well, the form, we want to bring the premises and conclusion together more closely, get rid of this gap as far as we can. But, you know, an argument isn't any good if the premises are false, so we want to pick a premise that is likely to be true. Ideally, we want to pick a premise that is obviously true, but at the very least, we want to pick a premise that is likely to be true. Three, in filling in the missing premise, we must respect what the person actually means. Um, We'll talk about all this in a second. All three of these are going to involve some balancing off, right? These can actually pull in different directions. But before I talk about that, you know, I do just want to take one more step back, say a little bit about one and two and their motivation. One and two are motivated by the principle of charity. 
Um, Lavin talked about this in the first chapter. I didn't say a whole lot about it then because, you know, it was just kind of hanging there in isolation. The principle of charity is super important, but I think it'll make more sense if we see it actually at work, in action. So what does the principle of charity say? principle of charity says when you are interpreting someone's argument you make it as strong as possible you try to give the other person a good argument even if you disagree with them so we want to pick premises that will narrow the gap between or, or a missing premise that will narrow the gap between the premise and conclusion because that'll make the argument better. We want to pick one that will likely be true because again, that makes the argument better. If you pick a garbage, stupid premise, that's not going to give the other person a good argument. So anyway, principle of charity, try to give the other person a good argument. There's even a fallacy people will talk about the straw man fallacy. Straw man fallacy is when you give the other person a really stupid argument and you refute the stupid argument. And the straw man fallacy, you know, it's this idea, I think it comes from jousting or something, I don't know, the Middle Ages. A lot of logic stuff comes from the Middle Ages. People didn't have a lot to do in the Middle Ages. So... There was a lot of work on logic in the Middle Ages. A lot of these monks focused on nothing but logic because, well, they didn't have TV to distract them or the internet or anything else. But anyway, so I think it's, I think it's like, you know, these jousting targets were straw men or something. I don't know. But the basic idea is fighting a dummy or a punching bag, right? If you put, you know, Mike Tyson's face on a punching bag and beat up the punching bag, doesn't make you a great boxer or, or Klitschko or whoever's the Manny Pacquiao, whoever's a great boxer. Now, I know nothing about UFC, so just fill something in there. And if you like UFC, laugh at your professor for being out of touch. The idea here is, you know, this proves nothing. Anyway, I will talk over and over and over again in this class about the principle of charity because it is super important for philosophy it's very important for interpreting other people's arguments. Don't commit the straw man fallacy. Don't give the other person a dumb argument. In fact, go further. Try to give them the best possible argument you can. So, so why is this important? For one thing, it gives others the respect they are due. If you just try to give somebody else a stupid argument, that does not show respect, right? It also allows us to have a fair consideration of the other person's argument. And that's going to be something we'll really emphasize in this class, is being fair to arguments. And that will mean trying really hard to give arguments that you disagree with their best hearing. It'll also mean, on the other side of this, sometimes being harder on arguments that you agree with than you want to be, right? Why is that? Well, we're correcting for our own bias, right? We are hard on arguments we disagree with. We are often easier on ones we agree with, right? So we want to figure out what's true. We want to give every argument a fair hearing. Finally, why is charity important? Well, even if you hate an argument and think it's stupid or, you know, even just evil, you know, you might be pro-life and you get a pro-choice argument or you might be pro-choice and you get a pro-life argument. You're going to think not just that that argument's wrong, but it's bad in some way, right? Why would you want to try to be fair to it? Well, because if you can refute the most powerful version of an argument, a charitable interpretation of an argument, that proves a lot. If you attack a straw man, it proves nothing, right? It's like putting, as I said, the world champion heavyweight boxer or whoever 
you know, the best UFC fighter is, putting their face on a dummy and beating up the dummy and calling yourself the champion, right? That proves absolutely nothing. It's honestly kind of pathetic. Giving the other person a stupid argument and beating up on that stupid argument is pathetic in the same way. And it proves nothing in the same way. Okay. That was a big sort of little, well, a big detour. Let's go back to the argument we started the section with. The FDA has fully approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine. The Pfizer COVID vaccine is safe. Well, we have our guidelines for filling in missing premises. Should narrow the gap between the stated premises and conclusion. Well, we already said A is not very good, right? Why? Well, A does nothing or practically nothing, you know. I mean, I guess if you're really big on patriotism, maybe you think it's super awesome. Well, you know, so it must be safe, but it really does nothing, right? So get rid of A. But I think you can also get rid of D, right? You need to narrow the gap between the stated premises and conclusion. D does a bit of that, right? It says, well, you know, better than 50-50 that a drug approved by the FDA is safe, but it doesn't do a whole lot, right? If I said better than 50-50, it's safe, so it's safe. Especially if it was anything important, you'd be like, I don't know, man, that's not good enough. So we can strike out D. So that actually leaves us B and C, right? And if you guys are used to like uh, tricky multiple choice tests, this is usually the case, right? There's two that are just dumb, or one that's dumb, one that's pretty dumb, and then two that are really hard to sort out, right? One obvious gimme, get rid of it. One you have to think a second longer, get rid of it too. But then there's usually two left, and it's like, oh my, oh my goodness, how do I choose between these two? Well, how do we choose between these two here? Now, what I want you guys to notice is if you fill in B, you will get a deductive argument. The FDA has fully approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine. Any drug fully approved by the FDA must be safe. Therefore, the Pfizer vaccine is safe, or you might even say must be safe, right? Well, you fill in C, what happens? What kind of argument are you going to get then? You get an inductive argument, right? The F FDA has fully approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine. Drugs approved by the FDA are likely to be safe. Therefore, the Pfizer vaccine is safe or likely safe, right? You know, when we, when we say safe, it might be a little ambiguous. We probably mean something like not, is definitely not going to hurt you. We mean probably won't hurt you, right? Well, so which of these do we choose? You know, I think this is interesting, right? You know, this is one of those things that makes it hard. You know, we're trying to be charitable. We're trying to fill in missing premises. Well, we have to even make this choice. What kind of argument is this? Is it a deductive argument with B, or is it an inductive argument with C? Well, now notice what happens. If it's a deductive argument, remember with a deductive argument, premise is true, then the conclusion must be true as well, right? If it's a deductive argument, then there is absolutely no space whatsoever between the stated premises and the conclusion, right? It narrows the logical gap to absolutely nothing. Okay, so what do you guys think? Does this mean, okay, obviously B, no more question, we get rid of C, moving on? Well, what about two? 
is most likely to be true. Which missing premise is most likely to be true? If we interpret this as a deductive argument and we fill in any drug approved by the FDA must be safe. Same as saying all or every single drug approved by the FDA is going to be safe. Do we like that premise? If you don't, think about why not. Inductive argument does not do as much to narrow this gap. It does a lot. It's better than A and D, but it's not going to do as much as B. Remember, there's always some possibility with an inductive argument. Premise is true, conclusion false. But which is more likely to be true? Drugs approved by the FDA are likely to be safe, or they must be, they're all safe. Which of those is more likely to be true? Well, just as a matter of logic, a statement that says likely is much more likely to be true than a statement that says always or any, right? Now you might say, well, okay, well, we have one and two pulling in different directions. What do we do? We flip a coin? No. I think it's actually clear because it's not just that any drug fully approved by the FDA must be safe is less likely to be true. It's actually provably false. It's rare, but the FDA has approved drugs that turned out to be dangerous. Um, I have to do a little Googling on this, but Accutane, Vioxx, and Darvacet are all examples of drugs that turned out to be dangerous. They're, no, they're so dangerous they're no longer on the market, but the FDA initially approved them. So, in this case, you know, it's not that hard, right? C making this an inductive argument does really well on two. It's pretty rare the FDA to, you know, approve a dangerous drug. And it does pretty well on one. It doesn't do as well as B, but it does a lot to narrow the gap. And then B, well, it do, it's a little bit better on narrowing the gap, but it completely fails unlikely to be true because we can show it's false. So, but I'll just tell you guys, you know, one, two, and three are all going to pull in different directions sometimes. You're just going to have to make a judgment call. That's one of the things, you know, we want to give the other person the best possible argument. How do we do that? more likely to have true premises or less of a gap between premises and conclusion. We're going to have to balance there and we might not all of us always think that, you know, might not always reach the same decision about what the best balance is. Finally, three is going to pull in a different direction than one and two. If someone says something stupid and they're very clear about it, you can't try to give them a better argument than what they say. If I was actually talking to this person and I said, well, what do you mean by that? You know, like, what's your assumption? And they said, well, you know, I know the FDA is never wrong. They, they, every drug they ever approve is always safe. Even though I think that's not as good a premise as B, if that's what the person very clearly says, you have to respect that. So... You know, we have to strike a balance between all of these. It can be very tricky sometimes. You know, the kind of argument we have, you know, where it is might help us, you know. If it's an argument in science, it's very likely to be inductive. If it is an argument applying a legal principle, a moral principle, or it's an argument in math, very likely to be deductive. That'll help us in the kinds of premises we want to choose. But again, this is just the kind of thing that takes some judgment. That's why we're going to have to practice with it, to just develop that judgment.